Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome to a new video and also to a new video series here on my channel. As you can see by the title of this video, this will be part of the Hardware Legends video series. And we will start this video with the AMD Phenom 2 Tweaker 42, which is a very special and extremely rare CPU, probably one of the rarest CPU uh, CPUs you can find in this scene. So I bought the CPUs man this CPU many years ago on eBay and I'm collecting a lot of hardware as you probably um, noticed already with all the hardware I have in my background. So over the years I collected a lot of uh, different GPUs, mainboards, CPUs. I have a lot of unreleased hardware parts as well, which I think will be really in uh, interesting. So I have some unreleased mainboards here, which I will show in one of the next videos. I got the permission uh, to show them, so that will be really entertaining. I have a lot of very interesting CPUs, obscure, obscure mainboards. So let's say dual socket AMD mainboards that are extremely rare. So this is stuff we will discuss in the Hardware Legends video series. And as I said in the beginning, we will start with the AMD Tweaker 42. And the AMD Tweaker 42 is an AM3 CPU that's almost 10 years old by now. So um, we will also take a look at the performance today of a 10 year old CPU, see what the performance is like, for example, in Cinebench R15, multi and also single threaded, which I think will be quite interesting. And we will also use this board for it. Um, for testing, this is an Asus Crosshair 3 formula, which was one of my favorite boards back then. Back then, after I did the testing, I think like eight years ago when I had one of those boards, obviously I sold it, but I bought one of those back on eBay nowadays. Um, luckily, AM3 hardware is quite cheap. But going back to the Tweaker 42, this is an AM3 based CPU and was selected back in the days from AMD. So I don't really know how many of those CPUs exist, how many were produced. Rumors say that not more than 100 pieces. So it's probably one of the rarest CPUs that was ever created. I think it's also quite similar to the recent Intel 9990XE. So the um, 14 core highly binned CPU from Intel because it's also a part that you cannot really buy on the public market and it's very limited quantity but very high performance. And back in the days, AMD selected and pre-selected those CPUs for overclocking purposes. So they were sent out to some media to see what kind of overclocking they could perform on air or water cooling, but mainly also to extreme overclockers because back in those days, AMD was hunting for very high frequency records and they were basically pre-binning some of the Phenom 2 CPUs. So this is a very similar CPU to a AMD Phenom 2 X uh, Phenom 2 X4 940 or 955, but on average AMD said you can overclock a tweak of 42 about 100 to 200 megahertz higher than a 955 Black Edition. So basically it's the same CPU as a 955 Black Edition, but just extremely high bind. So we will use the Crosshair 3 formula. As I said before, it's using an AMD FX790 chipset. If you compare this to a board from nowadays, it's quite a lot different actually. So for example, we have a North Bridge and we have a South Bridge on those main boards like 10 years ago. Nowadays, we only have the platform controller hub, so the PCH, which is sitting on the bottom typically here and on boards Back in those days, 10 years ago, we also had a north bridge. And the north bridge was basically connected to the CPU over a certain bus, in this case, the Hypertransport 3.0. And it was basically a high-speed bus for um, data transfer between the CPU and the chipset. And then the chipset would um, have the connection directly, for example, to the PCI Express lanes. So you could use um, up to two times PCI Express 16, for example, for Crossfire X. And also, what you notice probably is also cooling. We're kind of going back in time now. So back in those days, we had those Fint heat sinks here, massive constructions with um, heat pipes and all of that. And I think we're kind of seeing this again now after they were gone for five, six years. So that's kind of funny. And what I also really like is that the AMD mounting is still the same these days. So I'm using this cooler for um, cooling the CPU, which I think was the, which was released recently with one of the um, latest AMD generations. And it's really cool that you can still use one of those coolers for quite old hardware. Obviously it doesn't have the massive or best cooling solution. So we cannot really overclock the CPU as high as we could with water cooling, but we will still try and see what we can get out of this chip and compare it to performance from uh, nowadays CPU. 
This is also kind of a hardware legend. So we have the Corsair Dominator GT, which was one of the best memory module back then. And it was rated at uh, 2000 megahertz 787, so CL7, which was really, really good. And you could um, push those uh, memory sticks really hard. So those were Alpida Hyper ICs and they could handle quite high voltage. So they were, those were rated at 1.65 volt DDR3. And you could push them easily uh, with like two, over two volts to um, like a CL6. So very good memories. I'm still happy that I um, kept them, that I didn't sell them. So if I'm testing like old hardware like this nowadays, I'm still using those Dominator GT memories. So the, they are also kind of a hardware legend. So I will just assemble the system quickly and then we will perform some Cinebench runs. As I mentioned previously, the CPU was mainly binned and also made for extreme overclocking. So um, yeah, the purpose of the CPU was to break records and I checked some scores on HWBot which I found was the highest score, about 6.7 gigahertz on this chip, while, which is also very interesting, the Phantom 2 X4 855 Black Edition hit over 7.3 gigahertz by now, which is kind of um, expected also, because if AMD only pre-selected 100, 100 of those chips, but then we had thousands or 10,000s of 955 Black Edition out there, it was kind of expected that eventually somebody would break the tweaker scores with the normal ordinary 955 black edition. System is ready and we are in Windows. We're actually in Windows 7. I'm using one of my very old benchmarking systems. This is something I used for the HWBot Team Cup in 2014, which I used for very pretty much the same platform. So I'm really happy that I kept my old SSDs. I can just simply plug and reuse those. So we will take a look at Cinebench R15. Um, we will just perform a Cinebench run. It takes forever, so we have a lot of time to talk about the CPU. The Tweaker 42, the name 42 comes from the fact that the CPU has four cores and the four cores are running at 2 GHz. Obviously, the 2 GHz speed is much lower than what we had, for example, on a 955 Black Edition. But the CPU, the Tweaker, was not meant to be run at stock, obviously. So it was a highly pre binned CPU that was made for overclocking. So AMD gave it out to overclockers who know what to do with the CPU. So also one more thing that's a lot different to a nowadays platform is the fact that we have a lot more control over things or we have a lot more variables uh, what we can play with. So for example, we have not only the multiplayer, we can play with the reference clock. The reference clock is not locked. On this platform it's 200 megahertz stock. We can go up to like 300 or whatever works on the main board. Then we have the hypertransport link. So basically the connection between the CPU and the north bridge. Then we can also change the north bridge clock. So back in the days, there were, was a lot of things you could play with. Also, there were some very strange um, things you had to take into account. So for example, if I remember correctly, the hypertransport link always had to be lower than the north bridge speed. And if you increased it too much, the system just wouldn't boot anymore. So nowadays overclocking is just a lot more simple than what we have on a platform like this. So we can also check the power consumption. Typically I'm using a current clamp for this, which is very convenient to use. So just put it to the EPS connector, the 12 volt connector, put it around the 12 volt rail, not around the ground rail, because the ground is also connected to the 24 pin, for example, so that would give wrong readouts. And we have about 75, 7.5 uh, amps pulling from 12 volts, so times 12, we have a power consumption of about 90 watt. Not really that much. Also, obviously, because the CPU is running at 2G and 1.2 volts, so it doesn't consume that much for the moment. Cinebench R15 is still running. Benchmark run is over. And what I find really entertaining is the fact that we have multi-threading score of about, yeah, just above 200, so 207 in this case which is very similar to the single threaded performance of uh, today's 8700K or 9900K. So 9900K with a single core is actually faster overclocked than the Phantom 2 X42 at two gigahertz with four cores. So that also means that if we would run the single core test now, it would probably be only at 50 points, maybe 60 points at best. So if we just compare the performance to 10 years ago to now, it's basically that um, a CPU nowadays has the same single core speed than a quad core back in the days with all cores combined. So that's kind of interesting. And also 
if you compare it to, for example, with uh, Pentium Gold G5400, which is also a recent Pentium that's on the market, it's a two core with HT CPU. It has a multi-threading score of 400, so it just shows how much more efficient, how much more performance a nowadays CPU has. So we are back in BIOS and it's just a beautiful looking BIOS like 10 years ago, it looks pretty legacy. Nowadays you can only find this design in server BIOS. So we have some very interesting options here. So for example, FSB frequency, which is kind of wrong because FSB, the front side bus only existed on Intel and not on AMD. So it should actually be called reference clock, which is set to 200 megahertz. So if this was a CPU with locked multiplier, we would overclock the CPU over the ref clock. We could also adjust the PCI Express frequency, which is currently 100. We don't have to touch it. We can um, adjust the CPU ratio. So just multiply it by the ref clock, it will result in the CPU frequency. We'll just use 14 for now. So resulting frequency would be 2.8 gigahertz on the CPU. Memory frequency, we can only select 1600 for now because there is no higher multiplier available. If we want to match it with what this, uh, the memory is rated for. So let's say we want to match it for 2G, then we would have to adjust also the, um, the reference clock. We will keep north bridge frequency at 2G and um, hypertransport link is at 1.8 gigahertz. If we go to CPU voltage, stock voltage is about 1.2 volt and we will just use 1.4 which for nowadays CPUs sounds much but that back in the days it was really not, not that much. The, C, uh, the CPU cooler is just not capable of handling let's say 1.5, 1.55 volt but if we would use a massive air cooler we would be able to run something like 1.5 and then maybe also achieve 3.5 3.6 gigahertz with this CPU. We will keep two volt on the memory for now. We could actually run it higher. Uh, this, the memory sticks can, uh, can handle higher voltages than that. But uh, as I said before, we cannot use a higher multiplier. So it doesn't really make much sense to push the memory even further. So just go to Windows. Back in Windows, CPU is running at 2.8 gigahertz right now. Actually, I had kind of some trouble entering Windows. I'm not really sure if it's maybe my OS because it's a very old OS or if the CPU or the mainboard has some kind of trouble, but it's running stable now. So running uh, Cinebench R15 just to get some power, uh, some uh, performance comparison numbers. And um, I increased the voltage from 1.2 to 1.35 and also the clock from 2 to 2.8G. And currently the current flowing to the EPS connector is like 13, 13.5 amps. So we're about, uh, we're at about 150 watt power consumption total of the CPU. And that's certainly quite a bit, uh, considering that it's only 2.8 gigahertz and considering especially the performance overall of the CPU, if you compare it to a CPU from today, we can just see how much more efficient a CPU from today is. Also, if you open, for example, core temp or hardware info, the CPU core temperature is actually very low. So we have like 60 to 65 degrees Celsius maximum core temperature, which is really low considering the power consumption of the CPU. But that's also mainly because of the structure of the CPU. It's a 45 nanometer based CPU. And also the die is quite a lot bigger than of a nowadays CPU. So the power density is also lower. We have a quite big power consumption and power dissipation uh, of the CPU, but on a quite um, big surface. So the temperature of the CPU is fairly low. Cinebench passed, we have 290 points. So there is a very linear increase of performance with frequency. So from 200 to 290, from 2G to 2.8G. So there, certainly we could increase the uh, performance more by Using a different cooler, increasing core voltage to probably 1.45, 1.5 volt. There is certainly headroom with this CPU, as long as we manage to cool it properly, which is not possible with this small AMD cooler. But if we would go for custom water cooling loop or even dry ice or liquid nitrogen, obviously we could uh, push the CPU far beyond four or five gigahertz and with LN2 or helium, probably something above six gigahertz. So. It was very interesting to see a CPU like this after almost 10 years to see the performance power consumption numbers uh, compared to a CPU from today. Also, um, also the speed, not just the core speed, but also the speed of entering the OS or just the post. Post of the system is quite fast. So the, the, the point from powering on to loading Windows is quite quick, but then loading Windows 
certainly takes forever, but it's, I think, also related to my very old SSD and the OS. So let me know what you think about this video series. If there is any hardware you would like to see, maybe I even have it, maybe I own it, maybe I can present it to you. If there's any specific software you would like to see in the future, like old benchmarks or something like that, just let me know down in the comments. See you soon.